green light. So it's great to see some um, CFOs actually show up in the people and culture meeting. <laughs> um, we do care. Right? We, yeah. we do care about people. Um, I'm Dave Chester. I'm uh, an Amplio consultant part of my time. Um, that's why they're having me present. I actually am the CFO for Isotalent, which is Rob's company. So I'm going to give you a little background about Rob. Um, Rob's a little unique in the HR space. I, you don't see a lot of HR guys with co-founder next to their name. Uh, Rob's co-founded a few things. I think you saw he's, um, he was with some of the teams of some really high growth companies, Alliance Health, Fusion IO, helped build those teams. Um, very, very hyper growth companies. Uh, then the last few years, um, 2018, I think Rob started his own consulting and recruiting firm called Mount Talent. Um, there he was hired on as with Alpha Global Ventures to hire all of their company, uh, people for their portfolio companies. Um, their, their, their fund was primarily investing in Latin America, so Rob's got a lot of expertise in hiring globally, not just in the US. Um, since then, uh, he went on with, with uh, Paul Alstrom, who was uh, the founder of Alpha Global Ventures, to start I think probably the first hourly recruiting model in Utah, where they kind of flipped the, the, the traditional contingent fee model on its head and uh, grew that successfully through COVID, amazingly. And, um, and then at the beginning of 2021, joined forces with Austin Miller, who's back there. Austin had an executive recruiting firm. They put their, their groups together and started ISO Talent. And um, so, so anyway, Rob's got a lot of expertise now that we're, we're talking about the current economic environment, how to hire in the current economic environment. Um, it has become not just a local, but a globalized uh, strategy. So we're going to turn it over to Rob now to, to okay. teach us more about that. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, fascinating. For those that caught the... the uh, the keynote up front, I was fascinating, and you'll see a lot of the data that we talked about today supported in what, in what happened today. So if I do this right today, uh, I will probably tick off about a third of the room. Uh, the, the, the rest of the, I'll offend probably all the room at one point or another because that's who I am. And, uh, you know, but hopefully we'll give you some interesting insight to what's going on. Um, what happened, what was just talked about upstairs was, uh, really going to be supported by, the, by what you'll see here from, from some of the data. And it was very, like there was a huge sense of relief when I saw his data and it matched my data. I was like, okay, like <laughs> I won't look completely ridiculous. Um, I'm a big proponent of dad jokes, okay? So we're going to start it off on dad jokes. This is one of my favorites that I just heard. So uh, apparently, so recent studies have showed that, that um, pet owners will sleep with their, with their pets, right? So I gave this a shot last night, and you know, long story short is I now need a new goldfish. So that's my dad joke of the day, okay? So you guys can, you can steal that as your own, tell, tell, your, tell your own, um, you know, your kids, and, and uh, don't give me any credit on that, okay? So things have changed. Uh, there are a lot of HR adages that um, they're dead, uh, and they will be dead forever. COVID changed everything. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the math, which we'll go through here in a little bit. Um, higher fast or higher slow, f fire fast. Uh, that is now higher fast, fire fast. Uh, it is an honor to work. It is your honor as an employee to work at this company. Um, that sounds benevolent, but like I, everyone in this room has gone is, has been on the giving end of of, of uh, layoffs, right? And so it's different. We just, you know, we look at things a little bit differently than when my father, who worked at the same company for 45 years, that's, that, uh, that is different. Um, there is a massive, massive shortage, and there will continue to be forevermore a massive shortage of employees. Uh, and so you have to start taking out some of these disqualifiers that have just been a stamp, you know, with felons or or you know, credit scores or drug tests or things like that. You have to look at that differently and look at more at a case by case and a job by job basis. Um, probably the biggest trend that we're seeing that is affecting most of it is tenure in an employee. Uh, you know, the old way of looking at things is you tried to get at least three years out of employees. Um, that, is, that trend is gone, to, it is at now at 2.3 years 
and the trend is going down. It's not going up. It, so, and it will continue to go down as, as the, the groups that are coming up out of college right now are managing their career and being taught to manage their career differently, right? So it's gig economy type of thought process, okay? Which will affect how you should implement your benefits, incidentally. Um, and then candidates, uh, which goes to process, candidates should meet several people within your organization as you go through recruiting. Um, you can't do that anymore. Um, you, have to, you have to trust your, your organization uh, a little bit differently to, so it can go faster. So, well, this is, so here's the math, okay? Oops, let me go back. Um, sorry, this is not liking me very much today. So the math is this. For every job, we just heard it, uh, and I, I would, this is the one, my one argument against uh, the economists upstairs, is the math is actually two jobs and, two, and arguably 2.1 jobs for every one job seeker. The one thing that he didn't take into account the, is there is a group of about 300,000 individuals, uh, job seekers in the United States that uh, are gaming the system. And so you just, you, you mathematically take them out and it pushes the numbers up to about 2.2 to 2.1 jobs. And it has been this way forever. And this is like, this is this, this month's data. This, and it just keeps going up and up and up. Um, I think in March it was uh, 1.7 jobs for every job seeker, and so it's just going to keep, it just keeps going up. Job seekers, this is the one that's really important right now. Pay attention to this. Job seekers are on the market for 19 days. Okay, that's the average, right? The good ones, the good ones are off before that. Okay, so you have to think through how fast you can get your job seekers through your process in order to be successfully get the people you want to get. Okay, no one, no one goes out to hire somebody like I really want a solid C player. Right? That's not a thing. So if you want an A player, you've got to change your, your, the way that you're doing business to hire and attract talent to get those A players. Um, the wages, everyone knows this. Wages are uh, going up exponentially. And there's, like, there's no good data on this. I'll tell you, it like, doesn't matter if you go to Radford, salary.com, everything that we're seeing is about 30%, 20 to 30% lower than what the data is showing right now. So is consistent up and down the wage spectrum, or are there... It is consistent up and, you know, there's a, there, there are more, there are few exceptions to that being true, right? There are, the, the exceptions are usually on the, the not fun side of life, right? We all know that, uh, for example, we'll talk about this a little bit, engineering, uh, software engineering in particular, they are outpacing, they're outpacing uh, normal inflation rates by about 30%, and so, and they, they are, you're just getting a premium for it, and they're, Interestingly enough, painting themselves into a bit of a corner right now because they are pricing themselves out of the market to where people, lots of companies at scale, so our client book right now, uh, about a four, uh, third to a fourth of our client book right now is looking to go international because it is, you know, they can get two for one, three for one, and sometimes four for one um, based on what, depending on which country they go into, right? And so it's, it's, uh, it's a real problem. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit about the tenure factor. By the way, please ask questions all the way through this. I would like this to be a discussion rather than a dictation, okay? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the math of what a successful hiring practice looks like. To get one job, right, to hire for one job, you need 35 applicants. The average right now is 35 applicants come to the top. Whether you're getting them or you have a recruiter going after them, it's 35 people. Uh, to get that, that will get you t about 12 qualified people that are like going to be actually qualified to do the, you know, your role. Um, six of them will what we call fully, you know, fully qualified where, you know, they not only have the hard skills, but, you know, they're not jerks and they match your, cult your, your internal uh, culture. And then, you, you know, you'll send two to four of those guys on to an onsite. Two of them will be hireable. You'll make one offer. A lot of times you'll make two offers and sometimes three offers, right? because of the speed, the speed issue. That's the math. This is important to know because you have to game the system now knowing this math, okay? So let's, let's break that down a little bit more uh, into this. If you are going to remember one thing and, and you go up and you're gonna go to lunch, this is, the, this is the data, right? This is the piece of data that you need to know. The, you will, this will not change. You, we ha in order for this to change, to get down to like a 1.3 1.3 jobs to uh, one job or one job seeker, we would have to have a COVID-style economic disaster, right? 
So even at COVID, we didn't have a one-to-one. -one. So just to get down, so we, you have to, the, your new reality, our new reality is dealing with, there are always going to be more jobs than job seekers, right? And so what this does is change the pools that we have to fish in, right? I'm a big fisherman, we'll talk about this in a minute. I love to fish. And so you will need to change how you go about that, right? Who you're going to, where you're going to look, right? Um, and expand not, in, in, and in the one thing that in a positive way that COVID changed is that because we went you know, remote, everyone went remote for a season and is now coming back, we are now open to the idea of like, hey, maybe I can hire my controller and they can live in, in Wyoming or they can live in Mexico or they can live in Iowa, right? And um, we're, we're more used to that idea, okay? Oh, uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, Malin, you know, by chance, or Austin? I, I, I don't. The only thing I know is like six to eight months ago when we started to monitor this more, there was about 1.4 jobs to every one job search, and it just continued to increase. And I don't know as far back like pre-COVID or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks across the board, right? Uh, um, skilled labor, uh, like, I mean, go to McDonald's right now. Uh, we, it is like, you know, McDonald's right now, uh, or Taco Time was my favorite. Taco Time, if you work full time at Taco Time, you will make $42,000 a year. I went to four years of school, and I came out of four years of school in this millennium, and I was making $40,000 a year, right? Should have gone to Taco Time, right? Not really, but like, it's crazy. Like that's, 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 that's the issue right now. And, and he actually spoke about it upstairs a little bit that, uh, on the math that supports that, but um, it, it doesn't matter which industry you're going, like there's no exception to this and, and, and some industries are worse than others, right? And so let me give you the, the, uh, an interesting stat right now. So um, Fang, right? So Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, that, that group of, of people, they, uh, on their normal requir requirements to hire every year for engineers, 80,000 engineers a year. That's, if you aggregate all, all the big guys, right, 80,000 uh, engineers a year. The United States produces, out of, the out of their university system, 80,000 engineers, right? So when you see that they are going to freeze hiring, like Facebook said, they're freezing hiring for, uh, you know, their engineers for the rest of the year. Like everyone should stand up and applaud. Like that's the greatest thing that's ever happened to anyone who has engineers because they are taking an outsized portion of that. But it's okay. So what you're seeing is companies have to get creative to go find their talent. And, and oftentimes that, crea that creativity, um, it, it ends up to be an economic head or a tailwind for you guys. It's, it, it's wonderful because you get to go into other industries, uh, other markets that have cheaper labor pools. So. This is a big thing. Let's talk about getting your A players. If you want to get your A players, if you take out, there, there's two long poles in the tent when it comes to recruiting, right? The first is finding talent. That's about 40% of the time taken uh, is taken in, in what the activity of sourcing talent, right? Find, actually finding the bodies, okay? The next, I think about 20% of the time is just your scheduling, okay? You take those two things out of it. You need to optimize your process to take a human from the start, I open the job to an offer letter in seven calendar days. And I would argue four calendar days, right? If you can go back to back to back on each one of these things, that, you know, recruiter screening, engineer or uh, hiring manager screening, on-site interview, and salary negotiation, those are four touch points. You only get four touch points. If you're doing more than that, you are not going to get your A players. If you get an A player, it will be, it will be statistical nominally and not something that you can consistently do, right? There's nobody in this room, there's not, a, there's not a company in the state that has enough clout that can go and say, well, I am blah, so I'm just going to get whoever, you know, I'm going to get the best of the best. I'm sorry, that, that is, that's the days of yore, you know, if you will. That makes sense? So you have to go fast. I have a client right now, and I just want to murder them because they're like, hey, it's like 12 interviews. And, they're like, and then they get mad, they're like, hey, we're not getting... You know, we keep missing our people. I'm like, 12 interviews, you, you can't do that, right? Because what happens if the, good, if, if the average time that people are on the market is 19 days, 12 interviews is like 25 business days or 25 calendar days to get someone through that kind of process. Moreover, in the, in the real data point that you want to be thinking about is if a candidate is employed 
how many times do they have to take time off to go? The answer should be one. One half a day. Take one half day off, to, off, off of their current work and then go, and then you know, they can squeeze in an interview you know, for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it may be, and that, that's different. But one half a day, if you're, if you're asking your candidates to do any more than that, you will miss the good ones. Any questions on that? For a lot of roles, especially those that those in this room may, may be hiring for, we're really not hiring people who are looking. We're hiring people who are in great jobs and pulling them away. Do you, I'm curious if you think this changes materially if they're not looking, but, but we're pulling, pulling? Yeah, so this is actually one of my favorite. So it, um, it is, it's all that much more important, right? Because if, they are, if, they're, if they're actively working, like they don't, you know, nobody wants to indicate to their current boss and put their current situation at risk, right? So like nobody wants to do that. So it's all that much more important to get that really, really tight process, okay? Um, the second thing is though, is I wanna touch on that adage. There's an old HR adage, right, that, you know, active candidates are not the best candidates. That is like, that is forever dead. And let me tell you why. Um, the new millennium, the, like the new group, of, the new group coming out of college right now, they are, they're, they look at work differently, right? It's, it's what can you do? What have you done for me lately? I go did it. I go, I've done it for two years. I'm off to the next one, right? So by definition, you are going to have a lot. And, and what we are seeing, what we've seen for the last couple of years is a lot of active job seekers, right? And they're excellent. They're absolutely Phenomenal. There is no difference in quality between active job seekers and passive job seekers. So, like, um, that's that's like an old school train of thought. And like, don't I, like, and I I wholeheartedly believe that for you know the first 15 years of my career, um, it is definitively dead. So, um, but based on what we're seeing in the marketplace right now, the question in the back, anyone? I, no. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. more costly or is that one of those old <coughs> no I still think I still think that's true um, it, it goes so uh, I think you're absolutely right it's still true that the so what it does is you have to really prepare before you open up the job right is really define what you want up front right um, a lot of times what we see is is that when people open up their jobs they will they will spend the first two and a half, three weeks calibrating. I'm like, oh, okay, let me see two candidates, three candidates, and like, oh, actually my job is this, right? And that's fine, like, it, it, that's a natural, I mean, that's happened since, you know, uh, the day, the first day I've, I've recruited, right, is that people will go through that refinement process. The faster you get to your, your true center, right, of where you're actually, what you're actually looking for, the better, right? Because um, if you hire wrong, it still is, it can be quite costly. That, that will, I think, I don't think that that will ever change. So, um, having and I, having said that, because I've fired a lot of people as well. So, a um, couple things. So to optimize it, to go to an optimization point, um, culture is very important right, it, nowadays, especially the, in, in the younger generations where they're coming out and they they're they're wanting so you know they want to know what your social uh, statuses are and, and how the, your, your social um, your company's cultural social you know drivers are right. And so, and I will tell you. Getting the wrong, a, a, a misalignment on this can actually be quite costly and uh, detrimental to the internal culture of your company. So the best way to do this from a, from a strategy and a process standpoint is get a culture cop, right? Uh, MX does a pretty good job of this, for example. MX has one of the co-founders, and I think that it, up until, I know it was true six months ago, that co-founder interviewed everybody. Like he spent his designated 25% of his job was to talk to every, like the last candidate. And if they didn't meet the culture, the culture that MX wanted, they got booted. And so, um, and it's a good way. And they've kept a really kind of steady culture of, of who they want in, in, in their organization. Pay strategy, know your pay strategy up front. It actually really cuts down on your negotiation time. And it, it goes inside with this 80% of the first thing, can, on the surveys that we did, we, we interview or we surveyed a million candidates uh, through our friends over at Refrio, um, a million job seekers. 
Eighty percent of them said the very first thing they look at in a job description is for the job, the job wages. You're wasting your time by posting anything that doesn't have the job wages. Like if it's an old, it's a bad practice. It's an old practice. Don't do it anymore. Post a job range within you know twenty k of yourself, and you will save yourself a boatload of time, right? Because if a candidate comes back and says, "Oh, I want something outside of this range," you're like. Hey, dum dum! Like literally, it was posted on the first thing. Why are we still talking? And it usually brings them back to center. Okay, so that's uh, that helps out uh, quite a bit. On a pay strategy standpoint, here's my my thought process on that. You can go through a lot of different things, and it, and it depends on you know. There are a lot of factors that go into this. You know, what your health benefits look like, 401ks, are you providing equity? You know, those all those sorts of things. Okay, but. Um, from a cash perspective, it, cash is still king, okay? Um, it's king for us uh, internally, but it's also king for the, you know, the, your workers. A 55% strategy has never done me wrong, right? So if you're paying 55% of the, what the market is, just a little bit above average, you will always be okay. Like, you rarely have to go off negotiation, and then you can lean into some of your, your ancillary benefits that, that will say, hey, look, yeah, you might be getting a little bit more cash here, but their benefits are worse, that sort of thing, okay? So, um, so that, that, is, that is something that, that has always helped, helped out. Okay, this is my favorite new topic right now. Um, those that require 100% work from office, if you require 100% work from office, you need to plan for your job to be, your position to be open literally twice as long. It is 2x, okay? Everyone wants a hybrid situation. And hybrid could be 80% of the office and 20% of the home. They're just looking for the flexibility, right? Um, I was talking to Brandon Fugel a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, and I've, I've talked to Brandon Fugel, I've touched about touch points with them every two or three months. I'm like, hey, Brandon, everyone's working from home right now. Like, how bad is your business? He's like, everyone's resigning. Everyone has resigned their, 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 their lease rates right now and re-upping, no, like, he's like, we are not seeing any drop off. And I could not wrap my head around that. And it was because every, people in this room knew what was happening, what was going to happen right now, where we're seeing everyone's coming back saying, yeah, guess what, the work from home thing, where the whole company's gonna work from home, it's, it's dead. Like, 100% work from home is like, it just is too hard. It, like, it doesn't work across every, every department. Like it's one thing for engineers to do it where they're super, you know, where there's a lot of introverts or they have spent the last two decades putting together agile methodologies and, and putting that together. Turns out marketers don't want to work from home. They say they do, but they don't. They like humans. HR people, we love humans, right? And so, you know, that, that is uh, really, really important. So um, I don't think 100% work from home is going to work. You're seeing a little, some pushback on this hybrid, hybrid stuff, but it's just because no one likes to be you know, held accountable. But I, it, that's where things will go, right? I don't think though, um, I think hybrid is the new norm, okay? Um, this is my favorite one right here. The non-traditional schedule that, hey, uh, you know, four tens, uh, you know, I, there, I will not name names, uh, but there was a pretty prominent startup here uh, locally that they were on social media forever. Hey, we're four tens, we don't need to work on Friday. You know, we can get as much done, in, you know, Monday through Thursday. You know, nine months later, they laid off like 60% of the workforce. Turns out, when you cut out 20% of your, 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 your days to work, you get about 20% less return on, on what's going on. So um, traditional, you know, the, the five days a week plus is, is actually, it's been tried and true for a lot of decades. Okay. Um, Cost to hire. This is this is the things that this is the one that is is um, having the most influence. These two right here, right, is is the wage, right? It is going up tremendously. And so as we go through this economic uncertainty, um, what was interesting is that we didn't get a timeline of when the economic uncertainty will will come out of this. My my suspicion is by 2020, you know, you know, Q2 of 2023 will be humming pretty good. But you know that's that's what that we're seeing on the job market side. That's that's my personal prediction. You guys can stamp it, tweet it later, right? Uh, I do want that credit. Um, but I think in the meantime, you guys are in this room are being asked, hey, what can we do to to cut costs, right? What I would tell you is there are places that you can go and fish uh, for different talent that are 
the same level or higher caliber of talent, and, but they cost, you know, like I said, you can get a, you know, you know, 75% on the dollar, right? Or one, you know, two for one. Or uh, if you go to, for example, if you go to uh, Columbia right now, we're seeing a five for one on the engineer with no degradation in, in, in talent. Very, very fascinating stuff. So um, this is, this is, these are my job offers. This is actually, I mean, straight out of data, these are offers that I've made. So this is a 15 year, these are 15 year engineer, uh, senior engineer, non-architects. I remember uh, I worked at Fusion IO in 2011, we took them public in 2011. Um, by all accounts, Fusion IO was an engineering firm led by engineers, okay? Um, I had to, we had a, a tremendous, tremendously talented, super senior engineer um, that was like basically unicorn talent. We had, a, we offered them $140,000 and we were just aghast, all right, in Utah. We could not believe he was asking that much money, but we had to have him. And it was a knife fight. We had to go to the board. We were, I mean, we were a big company that we were making 100 million plus and on, the, on our way to, to a half a billion at, on a rocket ship. And we had to go to the board to get that, that approval, right? In 2000 level. Two, 2022, $210,000, no problem. In Utah, we have made offers for $250,000 for this thing. And it is not all that rare, okay? So we are seeing, and this is greatly, greatly outpacing any inflationary numbers. Like we are way above any, any inflation numbers. And so what's happening is these guys are asking for a premium and they're painting themselves into a corner because every, every person in this room, every HR person is like, this is not sustainable. We don't have the budgets for this. We've got to go find a different solution. And so what we're seeing is that we're seeing a lot of people go to different ponds. Now, I'll tell you, the only reason I have this picture up here is so I can show that fish. <laughs> 32 inches, baby. That thing is awesome. I, that is like, like I have, I love my four kids, that fish, and then a lot of other stuff. Okay. So that, but like, here's the thing. I love to fish. Okay. And I love to ca catch trout. I know which streams and rivers I go to catch trout. I do not go to the Jordan River to catch trout. If you want to catch some crap fish, you go to the Jordan River or some dead bodies, okay? That's what you catch in Jordan River, okay? So when people, it's always so funny to me, we're like, when, when people are, 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 are going and, and they're only casting their nets in Utah, right? And saying, hey, I want an engineer in Utah. And they're like, oh my gosh, this guy is so expensive. And I, will, and I do say guy because there's like four women engineers in, in, in engineering, unfortunately. I wish that that was different. And they're like, oh my gosh. I, like another, they don't, they don't help us on any of our DEI initiatives, right? I'm like, stop fishing in the Jordan River. Like that, you know what's in there. If you want something different, you have to go fish in a different fishing hole. This is what we're seeing right now. Um, and we love, we love the outputs of it. You can go to um, all of these different places and you will get, you will see more talent you, uh, by just by the volume of numbers, right? You will see some places are more expensive, but some places are less expensive. The entirety of my personal, so we, we do, a, we have a software package that we built internally. The entirety of my team outside of one human is what one, we have one of my 15 engineers born in the United States. Every other one of my engineers and, and product uh, group, or two, excuse me, two were born in the United States. Everyone else was born outside of the United States. Uh, we personally just hired a uh, mid-market engineer in Colombia for $40,000. I hired a QA engineer in Argentina for $26,000. And that $26,000 lady, she's so awesome, has a maid because, because of their economics are just different down there. My, my $46,000, $45,000 engineer in Venezuela also has a maid, right? Because their economics are different. And so what we're finding is when you go out there, and here's the thing that, that I personally love, they're on all my morning stand-ups, so I don't have to get up at, at nine o'clock, you know, nine o'clock in the evening to do a second stand-up because I'm doing offshore in India or in the Philippines, which we do, by the way, you know, we see lots of companies doing that as well. Um, and we, ha we see a lot of companies actually moving outside of Eastern Europe for, because of the conflicts that are over there. And so um, we, we have seen a lot of success in um, LATAM. Um, they're up-and-comers on, on uh, the STEM 
My favorite stat right now is this. 80,000 engineers are produced every year by the university. Mexico, who has a third of the population, their university system is producing 80,000 engineers. And they are excellent. Guadalajara, Monterey, and Mexico City are producing some stellar, stellar engineers. We have, um, we have not been stumped um, on any, any sort of technology out there unless, it, I, I take that back, we got asked for groovy on grails, which is like not a thing. It's like, it was like 30 year old technology. And that was the first time we're like, we couldn't find it because guess what? They don't, we couldn't find any in America either. So it's fine. Like, but they have everything down there. So this is what we're finding. It is a great way to, it is a great way to go find it. Any questions on this? Zero. Costa uh, Rica, they, they implemented an, an English uh, education system back in the 80s, and so most Costa Ricans will speak both English and Spanish. Mex Mexico engineers are the same. A little unknown fact, uh, programming internationally uh, is done in English. And so if you're an engineer, it is done in English. And incidentally, most of them learn that it's, it's like my favorite thing. So like when we've done our interviews, we will only do them in English. And, and What's funny about it is like, is how good their English is because they're not learning it from the schools. They actually learn it from watching movies. And so they like, like they literally watch, you know, they learn their English from watching Goonies. And so, um, which by the way, if you watch Goonies lately, like there's, a crap, there's like a ton of swearing. I don't know, the 80s, oh, the 80s are indifferent, right? So, um, so their English, is, their English is amazing. What's that? Go ahead. Yeah, their English has just absolutely been amazing. Yeah. Any other questions on that? How is productivity uh, kind of return on investment, uh, productivity for the dollar of salary? Uh, amazing. Uh, it, it, they, they, they punch pound for pound against any, anyone we have in the United States, right? So my favorite, so Vasion, for example, they, uh, they, they've been a, a great client for a long time. Um, they hired a mail in the 30, 20, 22, I can't remember, Vasion? Yeah, 20. 20. And so pound for pound, uh, they're doing great. My favorite story was um, on one of their earlier hires. Um, HR laws are terrible in Latin America, right? Meaning, uh, how should I say it? I, uh, don't misunderstand that. Uh, they, are, they can collude prices. And so, for example, in Monterey, Mexico, um, the HR, heads of HR for the major corps around there will get together on a regular basis and they will get together and they will include prices on what the salary should be and then they, and then, you know, that's what it is. So in order to get around that, they have to jump jobs. And so you'll see their, you'll see their resumes, you know, 12 months, 18 months, whatever it may be, and they're gone to the next job, which, which leads to some interesting exposures to technology. They see a lot of more technologies than, than our engineers do, but they are not used to engineer, or they're not used to companies treating them well. So the head of HR of Asia at the time uh, sent them out their welcome packet, which was literally, I think it was just, you know, it was a tumbler, it was a t-shirt, and it was like, I mean, it was like $50 worth of stuff. It was not a, a lot. He called them up and he called them up and the, and the engineer was crying. He's like, I don't, he's like, I don't, I've never had anyone treat, treat me like this, right? That's say they went on and they implemented their first raise at 10 months, right? Because they knew that, that it, they had this risk of leaving it at, at a year to go get the next raise. Again, tears, because they've never had anyone uh, leave. In the two and a half years that they've been there, they've had one engineer leave, right? So their tenure is through the roof. So it's a creative, a really creative way to keep talent in your, in your company for a lot longer. The one thing that's absolutely true that, that the productivity goes up long, you know, it is very true that the longer you keep an, an individual, a highly productive indi individual in your company, the better. Uh, that, that will be true forever and ever. And so, you know, the disruption of having people leave is, is terrible. So anything you can do to increase that tenure number is very, very important. Um, okay, and then, you know, here, here's, this is, this is my favorite thing, right? So. Uh, the D and I like, oh my gosh, you can't talk to an HR person and not, you know, they can't, you know, they can't wait to get that out of their mouth, right? And everyone's like really upset right now because their D and I initiatives aren't going as well as they want because they keep fishing in the same pond. Hey, guess what? Utah demographics, I'm sorry, like, it, what is it? We're 70% white, 
white, right? Like we have predominant religions here. So your demographics are going to be what your demographics are. But if you start fishing and, and going to different places to find talent, you naturally will have more, you, you will have a more diverse uh, workforce. My, 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 employ, my current employee base at ISO Talent, for example, we do, we, we do a lot of people, or we have a lot of people that are international. We, I am the minority by a lot. I think uh, white Mormon male, I think we are well below 20%. So, um, which is a rarity in, in Utah, you know, but it's just because we decided, and we didn't go out and say, hey, we're gonna do this for d &I purposes, we just did it. And that was the natural result of it, which has been amazing. Having those different cultures, those dis different perspectives has been amazing to our, uh, to our, our um, company. Okay, real quick on benefits. Um, this is the last thing I wanna talk about before we get into uh, some Q&A. For your best on everything doesn't work anymore, right? I'm talking equity, I'm talking like, I'm talking your 401k, I'm talking like everything, right? If your average tenure is 2.3 years, like all your vesting does is ticks people off, okay? And it, and it actually, it, it puts them off, okay? So it, particularly on your 401k, if you're gonna spend the time to go put in a, a, a 401k, remove the vesting off your 401k, it's cheeky, okay? Um, th when you think about benefits, think about it in terms of demographics. For example, we have ol uh, uh, your older population of your employee work base will have, it will be more important for them to think about retirement, those kinds of benefits, right? We implemented at, um, at our work, uh, we have a, like, I think our average age is 22 uh, uh, or 23 uh, ISO talent. So they don't care that much about 401k. They wanted to travel. So we introduced uh, Don Day. If you, haven't introduced, if you haven't heard of Don Day, it's a travel perk, right? Um, we match 50 bucks for their 50 bucks and they have a concierge travel agent. They love it, right? Really interesting stuff. Interestingly enough, the younger generation really wants to know about financial help. Oddly enough, wants to know about financial help, still doesn't care about retirement, whatever. <laughs> so that's fine. May one day they will, that will switch. Okay, health benefits. I'm going to give an unplug, uh, un, a very um, good plug about this for my friends upstairs. Health benefits do not have to go up. The last three, the last three cycles that I've run um, are uh, minus 15, a zero and a zero on my health benefits, right? That, and I love talking to finance people because only there's only this room is gonna understand what that means, right? Um, you, you will see a lot of people where your health, your, your health costs will go up by 10, 20, 30%. My worst one, you know, early on, I, we had like a 40 plus, we had to really make some changes. There, um, there are some really interesting brokers doing interesting thing. Diversified upstairs is pushing a major, major um, push on their pharma benefits. And I have several, several of my clients that are on their stuff. Um, Metasource, for example, saw a 20, it was $250,000 decrease in their benefit, on their pharma benefit on their first year, and it was up $450,000 on their second year, only on their pharma benefit, right? Which meant that they were, they went into net neutral for like three years and it really, it was a decrease. They just took the money and put it back into their stop loss, right? So if you get a good broker, you can do some amazing thing. Stop going to the guy that's in your neighborhood, okay? Go to a broker that's going to use the data and that has leverage buying power with the big, the big uh, uh, providers in the state and you can see benefits in um, that will keep your attention. The interesting uh, stat on Metasource, for example, they saw this decrease, um, this pharma benefit where they were, they provided more pharmaceuticals for their employee base, right? Um, and it caused their employee base to stay. They just, when they went home and had that conversation where, for example, you know, everyone gets that, that call from recruiter, hey, honey, I just got a call from this recruiter and, you know, to this new company. And what they found is, that, is their husband or their wife said, like, you're not leaving. Your health benefits are better than I've ever seen before. We can't afford to go somewhere else because that $40,000 a year drug that we are taking is now zero dollars. It is a substantial game changer, but you have to go to a broker that knows. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, what overall questions? Yeah. 
I'm not uh, zero investing on your 401k, right? D yeah, uh, I don't think there's any investor in their right mind that would get zero vesting. I, I would never argue for a zero vesting on equity, um, but uh, it, something has to give. Like the current vesting models are not are not going well, right? Um, I saw the worst thing I've seen in investing on an equity standpoint is a double trigger. So I won't name the name. I'm really mad at them. Um, they're not a client, so it's okay. But um, we still lots of humans out of the, uh, out of their th group because they were set to go public. They had um, they had uh, you know the market softened, so they, you know no one went public you know in, in the last half of the year, and they had a double trigger system. So you had to they had to have an event, and they had you had to be there in order to, in order to keep your equity. They, and if you left, you could be there for four years. You could, they said that you know these people that helped them all the way through it, and they are going to get zero. It's like a tragedy. So, but, so don't, do, don't be that creative, that's bad, right? But you like, you know, front end load them. Like if they're an A plus talent, right? You know, put the, what we are seeing that is really effective is where you put a lot on them, right? So hit them several times before they get to year two. So by the time they get to year two, they have three vesting schedules on there and it becomes economically unfun for them to leave the company. That's, that's how it, and, um, and I'll tell you from a board governance standpoint, it's easier to do that than go and try and, try and changing, you know, standard vesting rules that have been out there for years and years. Yeah. Okay, so besides software engineers, uh, <coughs> all the other employees, what, what's keeping them at their company or what's causing them to leave? So, Big uh, picture and like broad ideas. Uh, the first, the very first one, it's a good question, right? And it's the first thing is that uh, they do not know the companies that are retaining their talent are giving uh, career pathing on where they go to next in, this, in their organization, right? Um, the minute that an employee thinks, especially the younger generation, think they're in a dead end job, all right, or they've done what they're gonna do, they'll leave. And so career, and career pathing is like, could be anything, it doesn't have to be like, hey, you're gonna be the CFO in nine years. That, it doesn't have to be something like that. It's exposure to other stuff, so put them on, cro you know, cross divisional t teams, uh, you know, for whatever project may be, something like that, where they're getting exposure to, to broader business base and they're, they're seeing continual growth. So um, the stuff that's also keeping them, uh, is, again, is, is creative benefits, right? So um, if you have equity to offer, doing, layering your equity on, uh, good health benefits, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, we are seeing a lot of cause-based employees, right? They want to work for a company that, that, that they're passionate about. Um, those are, those are a lot of the A players will, will, will want to do that. So uh, it goes back to your culture cop, right? Make sure there's a good match there. What about terms and details policies? Oh, gosh. It, um, we're finally seeing the end. Of, I think we're seeing the end of unlimited PTO. Um, Unlimited PTO has been, it's, it's funny, we have our internal headache, like, you know, I have my guys back there, we're all laughing at each other. Like, unlimited PTO was great for a long time because we knew that it took, like, we knew the trends pre-COVID were, one, they didn't take, they would take off less work, right? And two, like, maybe most importantly to the group in this room, we didn't have that liability on the books where, where we had to pay it off. Like, that's great, right? The fun thing about Utah is you don't have to, right? So still don't do that, right? Like I'm a, I'm a pretty firm believer of not paying out your PTO at the end. That is like a, that is a huge millstone around your neck, right? Um, but we're seeing back, the problem with unlimited PTO is you have, we've had pretty soft managers that aren't holding people accountable. And so people are taking off like five and six weeks. And you're like, whoa, hey, unlimited PTO really meant three weeks. We were just being clever about it and it's blowing up in our face. <laughs> and so we're seeing a, a trend going back to more of a defined, a defined time where, where it's 15 to 18 business days off, right, is, is what we're seeing and actually tracked. So, so keep in mind, like when you go into other states, some states do, you do require to pay out like, you know, California and others. Yeah, so uh, 
everyone loves food, right? I mean, they're, they're, but food is expensive, if we're being honest about it, right? Food, I remember when we were at Fusion IO, it was like, uh, like our budget was ridiculous. It was ridiculous, right? Um, things and events go, uh, are cheaper than giving cash. Cash, um, when we give out cash and it, oh, oh man, I, the maddest I've ever, no, maybe mad is not the right way. The most irritated I've ever seen David Chittister at me ever is when I gave one of my employees a stack of cash. It, you know, I physically gave them a stack of cash, right? Um, and the reason why is like when you put cash into, a, into their bank account, it's a black hole. No one cares. Like, they just don't like, they're not good at financing. They don't know what's in there. Like it just goes and it's not motivating, right? So if you're going to spend these perks, do it so they know it's like, uh, like it's, you have to do it and, and think a little about, uh, think about it in kind of like a, a little more chest pounding way, right? We're like, hey, I'm giving this to you. So what we're finding that's very effective is things and events that they wouldn't normally go buy for themselves. So for example, concerts, uh, you know, go, you know, go get a, a weekend, you know, trip to, you know, just a staycation downtown at the Grand America, right? That's 250 bucks. You know, you give a $500 bonus and like, great, which is okay, but that's memorable, right? Or um, I remember even my, even my business partner one day, he's like, hey, I appreciate what you do. He came in, and this is my business partner, right? This is Paul. Like, he gave me, he came in and gave me some um, AirPods. I was like, that was really cool of you. Like, you know, because I wouldn't maybe no, normally go buy it for myself. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, if don't send them to a motel that has a number in it, right? If it's like, like that's like, like that, you're not doing anyone any favors on that. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, Rob, uh, what Rob forgot to do when he was handing out cash was, I said, so did you take his taxes out? Then, oh, okay. no, no, I just asked him to run the, to run the cash. The room was actually full. <laughs> I understood just fine. I just, I, just, I, knew, I knew what the consequences were. But giving someone six hundred, you know, six hundred and seventy dollars uh, bonus, bonus is not as cool as a thousand. Any any other questions? I'll be here uh, up, upstairs. We're running close out of time. One more, and then, uh, but I'll be up here upstairs at our booth all all day. So come grab me too. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, get a get a national broker, right? First of first of all, that's when you. I mean, that's when you have to get a broker that has that national at, at reach because, you know, if they're in California, like I mean, you're just you just, you have to go into different health things, right? So you you have different networks and that sort of thing. So make sure you got a good broker there. Um, it's it's harder. Like uh, there's just no two ways about it. It it it's, it it is a lot more difficult. But some of the things still still work just fine. You just have to be a lot better at your internal logistics, like shipping stuff. So if you're going to give them AirPods, you have to ship them to them, right? And you want, and like you have to like maybe require, hey, post it on your social, post it in your Slack that I just got this, right? Like as part of the requirement, so so you can get that brag moment. Because like that's one of the things when you go and give these things, like you kind of have to make it an ordeal. Hey, here's this thing. You guys all seen what I'm giving this person, right? And it's not for me. It's for you know to, to you know to hopefully motivate the person next to them to, to um, do a good thing. I think I'm, any, I, I think I'm out of time. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, I'll be up here, and I'll, like I'll be here all day. I appreciate you guys' questions and interactions. Thanks.